it gives me great pleasure now to introduce you to somebody I know who's done just that. They started out from scratch and they've now set up in Albury a national environmental centre which is the leading trainer of organic farmers in Australia and dare I say around the world. And not only that, they've done something else remarkable. They set the price for their food, they sell it in the marketplace and they get it every single time. So I'm really pleased to introduce you to Rob, who's a local from Albury, and he's going to talk to us about community-supported agriculture, the National Environment Centre, and how you actually get a whole community on side to create food change. He's got a half an hour, then we'll do the same thing, talk around the tables and follow up with questions. Thank you, Rob. Thanks, Cathy. Um, uh, first off, um, thank you and congratulations to the... Uh, catchment management team that put this together. I think it's a fantastic day and thank you for inviting me. Um, I work um, at, a, at a tiny little TAFE campus just north of Albury at Laguna uh, and my job is to teach organic farming, really biological farming because um, organic farming is really just a certification system that sits behind some of, some of the biological farm systems. Uh, and I'm going to talk about all those things that Cathy mentioned but um, I'd like to talk, tell them in the story of our farm and how it works. Um, and I think uh, as we go through that, a lot of the stuff that Cathy was talking about will become clear on our approach. We have a, a tiny little 400-acre uh, farm. Um, and if anyone's familiar with Thaguna... Um, if anyone's familiar with Thaguna, uh, then they'll realise that we're farming on very, very difficult soils, as some of us are. Um, Highly dispersible clays, uh, pH 4.2 and calcium chloride, low in everything except aluminium, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, very, very difficult soils to manage. Uh, we, um, and, yet, and yet, we're getting to a point now where our tiny little farm is becoming a significant economic unit. In fact, we believe in about three years' time, the way things are going, it would have the capability to support three families. With, with the income coming from it. So I'll explain that as I go along. Uh, the reason why we can do that is because it's a retail farm. We're not producing commodities. Uh, we're producing pork chops and lamb chops and honey and whatever else we grow for the people in Albury Wodonga. And so uh, we had a previous speaker talking about the different margins. That's the game changer for us with our tiny little farm. If we get all the margins for our whole supply marketing chain, then it makes a complete difference to the economics of the farm. Thanks, Cathy. So, um, uh, that's where I work. Um, here's, um, it might be Julian's list actually. Um, back in 1996 when um, we purchased this piece of land on behalf of the River Air Institute of TAFE, with the aim of setting up a, a low input organic farm to deal with some of the issues, we thought about the issues of the time and these are some of the ones that we came up with. Um, very similar to the issues that Julian was talking about this morning. Uh, this was a, a list of issues that um, a group just like you threw at us at the time when we were thinking about what we might do. And our aim was to try and set up a food production system that addressed, at least attempted to address, some of those issues. We knew we wouldn't be able to do it straight away. Um, in fact, we weren't sure we'd be able to do it at all. Uh, so we've taken a, an action research approach to this whole project. Uh, action research, uh, very, very simply, is a process of planning, acting on that plan, reflecting on that action, and planning again. And so we've done that over the years and spiraled our way towards um, achieving something in the landscape. So we had our list, we had Julian's list, and we're saying how on earth are we going to start designing a system like this and then make sure we keep working that way. Um, and uh, after quite a lot of soul searching, we came up with a number of really simple, short, easily understood rules that we call our farm rules, that are also our marketing tools, also our guidelines for management and all that sort of stuff that we applied first to the design of the farm system and then to the management. And um, I'd like to spend a few minutes just going through those first because that will allow us to understand a little bit more later on. 
Um, our landscapes, oh, sorry, our landscapes not too different from um, some of the areas around here, uh, where low rolling hills uh, rolling down to uh, small intermittent creeks they end up draining into the Murray River. Um, we're about to be surrounded by um, red tile roofs. Um, we are about to become an urban farm uh, uh, with all the uh, good points and bad points that go along with that. It's great to be surrounded by your customers, but uh, sometimes those customers can be problematic. So, uh, but uh, that photo was taken a number of years ago. If you looked at that now, it'll be slightly different with the houses starting to come around us. <clears throat> the first thing we said was, given that the type, the forms of energy we're using in our farms are causing problems, given that we're pretty sure that those forms of energy are going to get more and more expensive, given that we want to make sure that this system we're setting up is going to continue to produce an income and continue to be a viable business, doesn't matter what a barrel of oil costs, one of the first things we set up was this very simple rule on how to design and manage our farm, and this is just our farm, energy. And we just call it one star, three star, five star energy. So one star energy is the energy you get from the diesel barrel or from flicking on the light. Three star energy is our cultural energy, the energy that I'd use if I put a hoe on my shoulder, went down the paddock and chipped thistles. We don't want to do that much either. And five star energy is the system design energy, the, the energy that we can design into our farm systems so that it does it itself. And so every time we make a decision on the farm, every time we look at our <clears throat> plan, act, reflect cycles and all that sort of stuff, this is one of the guiding principles. And it's led us in interesting directions. <clears throat> I just want to, um, the way we're looking at it is that we've got our farm ecosystem now, a normal eco, the way a normal ecosystem works, sunlight energy comes in and the different ecosystem processes partition that energy in different pathways to the wombat or to the gum tree or to the fungus or whatever. Uh, on farms, we use another form of energy to partition that energy in another direction, to the cows or to the sheep or to the strawberries or whatever. So what we're doing with our one-star, three-star, five-star energy is trying to design into the farm system again ways of that energy partitioning, uh, not to the Patterson's curse but to the ryegrass, uh, without us having to put external energy into it to do that. And uh, sometimes it's worked and sometimes it hasn't. The other um, thing we wanted to really focus on was, um, and uh, quite a few of the speakers have already touched on this as well, is the idea that a healthy soil ecosystem will support a healthy farms ecosystem as well. And so um, the management team on the farm, and uh, I should say that it's a management team, we have a small group of students that are interns um, that, that work on that farm every year and part of the management team. And the management team's role first is not to be a sheep farmer or a pig farmer or an olive farmer, but to be, and we've got a funny little word, greeblies, which is soil organisms, but to be greebly farmers first. And so our, our decisions are based first on what's going to happen to the soil ecosystem if we do something. <clears throat> uh, and um, that has probably had the biggest impact on the farm system than anything else we've done. Uh, and what tends to happen is that for a while you move along slowly and I think one of the previous speakers was talking about five years or three years, it depends on where you're starting from, but it goes like that. And, um, and, uh, and uh, 10 or 15 years ago we were struggling desperately to maintain a healthy sheep flock based on we're certified organic so we don't drench, we don't vaccinate, we don't do anything like that at all. And, uh, but as the years have gone past and our action research cycle has clicked in and got things, now our sheep just seem to do it automatically. This healthy soil ecosystem really does work. And uh, we run in relatively high rainfall country for sheep. We run sheep with never drenching, never vaccinating, never having foot problems or anything like that at all. <clears throat> the, um, that, that is an enormous, enormously a powerful approach for us and that's sort of the core for organic farming. 
is develop those, those, healthy, those healthy soil ecosystems. The other big issue for us that we thought about was water. Um, we just started this project in, in 96, so we had a couple of years and then all hell broke loose, as everyone knows, for 10 or 12 years. Uh, and so our approach in 96 was we don't know what the future is going to bring in terms of rainfall. We're not an irrigation place, um, and, uh, we, we, and we never would be, but um, uh, we'd never, we, we, we were uncertain about what rainfall we're going to get, when it's going to fall, what our evaporation rate is, all that sort of stuff. And so we were really designing in, in severe uncertainty, as we all do all the time when we're farmers. Um, so our approach to that, again, a really simple tool, like we've had the one star, three star, five star energy. We've had the healthy soil, eco, healthy soil ecosystems. This one was just to slow the water down. Um, our landscape, when human hovels staggered through in the early 1800s, was a woodland. And if you graph the water flows out of woodland systems, they look like this. They get a rain event, and over a period of time, the water runs out of the system. If you draw a graph of a grassland system, it's totally different. It goes whoop, gone. Creeks are high, flooded, possibly a road, then all the water's gone out of the system again. We set an aim that we wanted to slow the water down and have the rainfall that falls on our farm stay on that farm landscape for at least a month before it wandered off so we could make the most of it whether it was in April or February or whatever. That slide that you're looking at up there is um, uh, just uh, one of our paddocks that has been key line pattern ploughed. Uh, what we wanted to do was to have a rough landscape for a start. So on the, out in the paddocks where the production's going on, the water doesn't go screaming off but moves slowly through the system. So uh, I won't go too much into key line pattern ploughing, but for us it's an enormously powerful tool. We then said once the water starts running off our farm landscape, out of those paddocks that have been patent ploughed or roughened in different ways, we still wanted the water to stay and slow right down. And so we have a series of these swales. Now swales are just ditches that don't go anywhere. No slope, just flat. So that, that there's a little swale there, the water's run out of the, the, uh, the system up above it and is sitting flat in those swales, soaks down in the system that way slowing it down again. And then um, if you follow that swale around um, towards the trees, that goes around the contour and eventually spills out into one of the drainage lines on the, on the system and moves through a series of leaky dams. Uh, now, um, anyone that's been involved with farming knows that when you're building a dam, you key it in. <laughs> So you dig down into the clay and start building the dam wall down in the ground and build it up so that it doesn't leak. Um, we built these flat on top of the, they're only tiny dams, only a metre or so high, but flat on top of the grass. The neighbours thought we were absolutely crazy. But what's going on there is the water that's spilled out of that swale we looked at a minute ago is now spilled into these leaky dams and is zigzagging its way down the drainage lines before it runs out. And so in the end, we end up with a, with a system where the water stays in the farm for at least a month before it moves on. <clears throat> that doesn't work unless you can hold the water in the soil. And for us, we work on a really rough rule of thumb that for every 1% carbon you have in your soil, that's another inch of rainfall you can hold. Now, measuring carbon soils in soils is really difficult and all, all sorts of variables and stuff like that. But just on our standard swept soil tests, our soil carbon has gone from 0.2 up to 5 to 7 per cent, uh, depending on what paddocks there are, and we'll talk about that in a while. That means that that landscape can hold a whole lot more water. And so uh, our springs can cut out early now, and the farm's still more productive than it was before we slowed the water down. <coughs> We're a retail farm, and, um, and so for us, marketing is the thing. Um, we produce a wide variety of the things on the farm rather than just one or two things. We're not just sheep farmers. Like I said in the introduction, we produce lamb, pork, honey, olives, 
we're getting our head around vegetable production in our clay acid soils uh, and we're just mucking around with free range eggs and chicken production and stuff like that as well. Uh, because for us, um, it's much, much easier to find someone to buy a pork chop, a lamb chop and a jar of honey than to find three people to buy a lamb chop. So this diversity um, has got great economic strengths for small retail farms like ours. Our sheep, um, uh, African fat-tailed sheep, mostly damara, uh, although um, damara aren't particularly well muscled, and so we usually put a bit of something else one of the other shedding varieties, maybe a dorper, maybe a Wiltshire horn or something like that in them, just to keep the muscling up a bit. And we, we lamb all year round. Um, I just, um, just imagine that for a moment. Uh, how do you do selection? How do you, um, how do you compare the apples and oranges of lambs being born at different times to, for different mothers? Um, there's all sorts of difficulties with that, but the payoff for us is we're selling lambs every fortnight at our local farmer's market. And so we need to have that. We're almost doing the opposite to what everyone else is doing. So there's a, that mob of sheep there, 200 odd ewes with one ram in, lambing all year round. And if they start to bunch together, we actually take the ram out to spread them out again and then put it back in again. So it's almost the opposite to what everyone else is doing. We're weird, you know. That. Um, our packers for foxes, um, uh, if we, our, uh, we used to lose probably 50 lambs, maybe closer to 100 lambs a year, depending on the year, plus a majority of our boar goat kids uh, to fox attack. And our alpacas um, back in 1999 fixed it straight away. And Barbara, you can see Barbara with the big ears in the background there. Um, we're right, as I said, we're right close to town, so we get constant and significant dog attacks. Uh, and we would on average lose probably 30 odd ewes a year with their, th with their throat tripped out. Uh, we found that probably what's going on is the, um, if it was a town pack, uh, a pack of town dogs with a sheep dog type amongst them, they just kept working and working and working. Eventually the alpaca said, nah, this is too much and off they, off they went and the dogs were into them. But the donkey solved it straight away. Uh, Barbara's a hero. And uh, we, don't, uh, we don't lose any more sheep to dog attack. It works really, really well. And in fact, if there's any donkey breeders here, I'm after another one right now. So. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll do the questions. Yeah, yeah. Hmm? Right um, those sheep, as I said, were certified organic, um, never drenched, never vaccinated. Um, uh, and we just don't get sick animals. It just doesn't happen. Uh, we're also mucking around with uh, developing up our soil ecosystem strong enough to grow vegetables. Um, uh, that it's a great addition to the range of food that we produce on our farm. Uh, at the moment though, uh, our soil ecosystem, I uh, talked about that graph before that it improves like that, our soil ecosystem in our veggie world is still back on the curve, so we're struggling doing it. But the way we do it is we have mobile... The, the, this is set up on about an acre, um, and it, it, um, an acre of veggies produced this way with low inputs uh, will, will uh, almost certainly produce an income for one family on one acre if you're retail farming, uh, because the margins are so great. Uh, particularly if you're designing it with this one-star, three-star, five-star energy where you've got low input costs and all that sort of stuff. So we use chicken tractors um, and uh, with uh, Marimba Guardian dogs uh, to prepare the ground and all that sort of stuff for these things. But um, I spoke before about our action research cycle. And, uh, with our veggie production, we're way down at the bottom of that action research cycle at the moment. So we're still learning a lot. But um, we're, um, we're only probably six months away from having a, a box vegetable scheme to add to another part of the marketing of the farm. Um, this is a crop of oats. Um, one, star, one star oats would have been um, drilled in with a tractor and then harvested and put in the silo. These are five star oats. Uh, so um, uh, this is a colleague of mine, Jared Laurie. Uh, and, um, 
this is a, as a seventh year of an oat crop that was broadcast and seeded, then managed to reseed the following year to feed our pigs. So um, we used a, um, a little tractor and broadcast the oats out in the paddock. That pigs harvested themselves through the summer, uh, and then when the uh, seed density is right on the paddock, uh, we might um, run a, a quick harrow over it behind the little four wheeler to hide it from the cockies, and then away we go again next year. Sometimes it doesn't work at all, depending on what the, the false autumn breaks and things like that do, and sometimes it lasts for seven years. So that's a five star oak crop. We grow um, Berkshire pigs uh, out in the paddock, uh, and the, um, the idea is, is that um, uh, we have very, very little uh, one star energy input into these at all. So the great, the, by far the greatest part of their diet is what they harvest out of the paddocks. Uh, mostly onion grass bulbs and um, flatweed roots, that's their favourite. This guy's hooking into a bit of um, ryegrass by the looks of it. So um, they just rotate through the paddocks with the sheep, maybe before or after the sheep or whatever. Uh, and although we've only got a handful of, handful of sows, they add a significant in income into, into the farm system, uh, partly because the marketing costs are already covered by the sheep. I can sell Cathy a packet of lamb chops and a packet of pork chops at the same time. But also, because they're low input, there's very little the cost goes on the top of these guys. Uh, we budget on $450 a head at our local farmer's market for our, one of our uh, little porkers which is about the same price that, we, that they'd be if we were selling them at Woolies. But we get all those margins. That makes one litter of piglets worth about four and a half grand with very little cost taken out. <clears throat> um, that's uh, a Marema guardian dog, Bob, with his mob of chickens. Uh, what, we're, what we're trying to set up, and we're still a fair way from it at the moment, is um, real free-range chicken production. Again, with the idea of low energy inputs uh, being part of the cycle rather than something where we're dragging in one star energy all the time. And so uh, that is a, believe it or not, that's a 70 chook tractor, uh, but they're never locked in it. Uh, they go in there to perch and lay. And our, um, any commercial poultry or egg producers here uh, look at me and say, 70 chooks, that's ridiculous. You know, that's a, that's a backyard chook pen. But when we add it to the pork chops and the lamb chops with no input costs, it's a game changer again. A uh, little bit of honey for exactly the same reason. Anyone else keep bees here? Yeah, uh, we, we, um, we're really struggling and have been for years with our bees. Uh, bees are having an awful time all around the world at the moment, ours included. We also um, were really, really keen, if we go back to Julian's list that we had up a, right at the start to have a positive impact on our local environment. And so of our 400 acre farm, actually 200 acres of it is not used for farm production at all. Uh, it's, it's been set up as native habitat to modify the microclimate in, the, in our little paddocks, um, to provide those ecosystem services that we've been talking about all day really to the farm production system. Um, uh, but most of all, um, it's our biggest marketing tool of all because um, we're connected so closely to our customers. So we've ended up, here's our little farm. Uh, the wide areas are the actual um, farm production areas. Uh, the rest of it is um, natural ecosystems, wetlands, leaky dams, that sort of stuff. We actually have 70 paddocks in that, um, this isn't true, true map, there's too many lines to go on it. In that white area there we actually have 70 paddocks. And so that allows us to have enormously long rotations. Uh, that's the re most, most of the reason why we now have 5% carbon. That's one of the great reasons why we never have to drench our sheep or vaccinate our sheep or do anything with our pigs or our chickens or anything like that because of our long Rotations. I'm convinced that for in a, a lot of landscapes right at the bottom of that developed soil ecosystem curve, the best thing for you can do for your soil 
is not to buy a, uh, a bag of fertiliser or a, a deep ripper, but to buy some more wire. Um, Coles and Woolies, is someone from Coles and Woolies here? Because I'm going to about to tear into them. <laughs> this is how um, uh, some people believe that um, the population thinks about food. And that, uh, that thought is the reason why we're, we're heading where Julian showed us we're heading this morning. Uh, most of us here uh, have got a much more complex idea of what food is. And our customers, lo and behold, have got the same list as the list that we developed in 1996 to be the major issues for our farm system. So when we ask our customers that come to our farmer's market and buy our lamb chops or our pork chops or whatever, what, what do they think about food? Why are they buying it? These are the reasons why. There's our marketing done. <clears throat> for us, for a tiny little farm, with no, with, uh, no money to pour into a uh, huge amount of resources, there's absolutely no money in us growing food. None whatsoever. A few hundred sheep, a few pigs, a few bees, a few olives, that sort of stuff. But we get the money when we sell it. That's the, that's the whole difference to, to our system is that we're retail farmers. And um, here we are at our local uh, Hugh Murray Food Bowl Farmers Market, which is on tomorrow. And um, the people that have got the same world view as that list I just put up are our customers. That's our marketing is that we tell our story about what our farm's <coughs> worldview is and um, then people just come to us. It's all about connections and we've heard that nearly every talk. It's all about connections and um, I just threw this up just to remind me that I need to talk about connections for a moment. Um, I can spend a lot of time uh, growing slightly better lambs. I can grow a lot of, spend a lot of time growing maybe slightly tastier honey but it pays me a lot more to make a connection with a couple more customers. So we share a world view with our customers. And um, it's important for us to maintain that world view. And those rules that I was talking about back before, and Julian's list that I brought up before, is the reason why we're a successful farm, is because people share the same view that we do. And our farm demonstrates that view. In our marketing thinking, and this is pretty old stuff, everyone's probably seen this I think, but it um, explains how we work. We say there's four cohorts of customers for us. There's leaders, le leaners, learners and laggers. Uh, I feel that I'm talking to a room full of leaders. Those leaders share our farm's world view. Don't need to market to them at all. But if we needed more customers, then we using our marketing technique, need to find more people to become leaders, more people to share our world view. And so we go to the leaners and try and turn them into leaders. Down to learners, and I've put the laggers right down the bottom because we, um, we're never going to be able to do anything about those at our small farm scale. This farming systems that we're talking about are driven by our customers, and um, you know th this wonderful day has been put on for the CMA. I sometimes think, though, that the CMA shouldn't be talking to the farmers; they should be talking to the customers. And uh, and some of the the money that's to do with land stewardship should be turning people from learners into leaners, and leaners into leaders. Then, because no one can farm like this unless they've got customers, it's impossible. Yeah. yeah you're just sending your farm down the drain. So um, from a, just for the CMA's perspective, um, these days are great, but there's a room full of leaders here and we need to change a whole lot of leaners into leaders. That's it. Oh. <laughs> um, I, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, we only grow a small amount of sheep for the size of our, for our 200 acres, uh, but because it's layered 
that's a little bit more intense than that. Uh, because we're working one step up the food chain in that soil, because it's not really cropping soil, we're again losing about 90% in that step in that food chain up to the animal energy and protein. Um, so I, I know for certain that we're not producing the same amount of energy per area or whatever that you would be. But it'd be interesting to find out um, energy um, production per energy input or input, you know, input costs or stuff like that. That might be a different proposition again. But um, I don't think um, our soils would ever get to that really high production, except in the, in the veggie garden area uh, where we're putting a lot of inputs from other parts of the farming anyway. Yeah. Rob, how do you get on with the catchment management authority to slow your water down? Because there's always been a problem with slowing the water down and the catchment management authorities in various places want to speed it up. And I think this has possibly over the last 20 years had a real effect on yeah. agriculture. Yeah. Um, did everyone hear that question? Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> we don't go anywhere near um, storing our harvestable right if that's the approach we want to take with it. Uh, so even the, the volume of water being stored in those leaky dams is not very high anyway. Most of it's being held further up. Um, and it's not like we're actually um, holding it back and letting it evaporate. <coughs> Excuse me, I've got a bit of a frog. But, um, but uh, a lot of it's still eventually moving off the farm, but it's staying there for a while. And it, it actually has turned our drainage creek, which is the Seven Mile Creek at Laguna, uh, from a creek that does that to a creek that does that does that. Yeah, so no problems as yet. Yeah. Given that we're a TAFE, uh, given that we're in the middle of almost in the middle of the town, uh, it's not possible for us to be processors. Uh, although in the long long term that's our own. So at the moment we're contracting to a processor. Then we take it from them and do the retailing. But um, uh, there's a whole lot of um, significant issues with local small-scale processing of most foods, uh, and it's one of the uh, big blockers in local food economies. Yeah. I'm just intrigued by Barbara. Can you, what does she do for dogs? I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> Did everyone hear that? Yeah. Um, Barbara, um, she's got a mean streak in her. <laughs> Uh, and so um, she lays her ears back and all that sort of stuff and um, the dogs are just terrified when she starts braying. And she makes a hell of a noise. Uh, but she's very effective. Yeah. Any, any local support for our local town dog issue? Um, it's a tiny percentage of the local population causing the problem as usual. Um, so, and we don't think that that can ever be fixed. So that's why we've designed Barber into the system to, to deal with it. Like, I, I, I'm quite happy that we're becoming an urban farm because it's so much easier to main that, maintain that connection with our customers. You know, that's a great advantage for us, but there are disadvantages.